Good evening, everyone. Oh, good afternoon, I guess I should say. Uh, Merry Christmas is the better thing uh, to say today. Welcome to First Baptist Church of Williams. We're so delighted that you've, uh, you and your families are here to worship with us tonight on this most holy of nights uh, to commemorate the birth of Jesus Christ, to remember and to celebrate that and what it means for us today in worship. I hope that on the way in you grabbed uh, one of these orders of worship. If not, maybe your neighbor has one you can share with them. And you'll see we've got just a series of hymns we're going to be singing tonight, some scripture readings, some uh, responsive readings. And at the end, we're going to have the Lord's Supper, uh, which will be a special time. Uh, I'll give some more instructions about that when we get to that point in the service. But uh, we're really excited to just celebrate Jesus Christ uh, with you all today. So if you would, um, let's begin our time today with a word of prayer. And, uh, and then we will sing some songs. So, heads together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening, for a space and a place to gather together to worship, the bir- to worship your Son, Jesus Christ, to remember his birth, where the eternal Word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. God, I pray that tonight the hymns that we sing and the, the scriptures that are read, the parts that we of the service that we are able to participate in tonight would communicate the glory of the gospel to our hearts uh, in, in, in wonderful ways. God, you've caused this holy night to shine with the brightness of the true light. Grant that we who've known the mystery of this light on earth, that we may enjoy him perfectly in heaven where with you and the Holy Spirit, he lives and reigns, one God and glory everlasting. Amen. Amen. Let's stand as we sing hymn 145, if you want to use your hymnal. O come, all ye faithful. Let's sing it out tonight. O come. If you would, please follow along with me for a responsive reading. You can find this in the back of your bulletin, not your bulletin, hymnal, number 635, or you can read along on the wall with me. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. He came for testimony to bear witness to the light, that all might believe through him. 
The true light that enlightens every man was coming into the world. He came to his own home, and his own people received him not. Who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. can remain seated, but I hope you'll continue the singing. Hymn 141, O Little Town of Bethlehem. We'll do the first, second, and the last verse, okay? Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for him in the inn. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. 
you will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, to those whom he is well pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. That was a blessing to me. I um, I don't know if you remember this, but a year ago tonight, um, Bobby was supposed to read the Christmas story and was so sick uh, that he had to just be home, couldn't be around everyone else, and he watched it from right up there, and I stood right here, read that Christmas story, and I told Bobby, I said, one year from tonight, you have to be here and you have to read that Christmas story. And one year later, isn't God a good God? He answers our prayers. Now, why he brought dental floss and toothpaste, I don't know, Bobby. That I wasn't going to stand that close to you. <laughs> I want to do something a little different, okay? We, we always, and I'm so thankful for the folks who run the words and everything. It makes things a lot easier for many of you. But I want us to get out those hymnals, and I want us to sing one of these great carols with the sopranos and the altos, the tenors, the basses. I want to hear those parts. I want to hear your voices. Hymn 133, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, and let's stand as we sing that first and last verse on this great Christmas hymn. I want to hear you tonight, all right? Sing it. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king, peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies with angelic host proclaim. Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Sing it. Hail the heaven-born prince of peace. Hail the son of righteousness. Light and life to all he brings. Risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lays his glory by. Born that man no more may die. For to raise the sons of earth. Born to give them second birth. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the new. Amen. You may be seated. Well, to those with memories, the I don't think the dental floss, and the toothbrush, and the toothpaste up here were for Pat. Uh, <laughs> if you remember, Santa had a report on me earlier, and uh, <laughs> I think I think that he already came early today. So. All right, if you have your Bibles with you, I'd invite you to turn to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 1, Matthew chapter 1. We've read two accounts of Christ's birth, we're going to read the third one 
now. Matthew chapter 1, I'm going to read verses 18 through 25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but he knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, just as your son Jesus came down to earth 2,000 years ago, we also pray that by your Holy Spirit, he will be present among us now. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Whenever Samantha and I were expecting our two boys, uh, we, you know, one, one of the things that we did that was a disservice to our family and friends is that we didn't share the name before the baby was born. Uh, to be sure, we had a name picked out, you know, as couples do, you have a list and you each get veto power over any name on that list. Uh, but, uh, you know, this being the South, uh, I was uh, truthfully a little fearful that I would get everything monogrammed. Um, I'm a little less uptight about that now. But, uh, you know, but another reason that you might not share the name of a baby is because you kind of want, want to avoid the displeasure of people who may not prefer that name. Um, you know, if, if you still have three months to go in the pregnancy and you announce to everyone, um, like Isaiah would have had to announce at some point, we're, we're having a baby and the name is going to be Maher Shalal Hashbaz, um, which... <laughs> was a name that God told him to name the baby, by the way. Uh, you would have three months of people who were saying, you know your child needs to survive high school, right? Um, <laughs> please. But if they, uh, you know, if, if little baby, Mishur Shalal Hashbaz, is carried to them and the name is told, then all they can say is, isn't that cute, you know? <laughs> but the fact is, names mean something. I remember where I was when I learned that Ryan, the name that my parents gave me, meant little king. I mean, I think you would remember that too if you were, you know, five years old. Uh, What's in a name? What's in a name? It's a question that Shakespeare asked in the play Romeo and Juliet. Uh, There, Juliet asked the question, uh, actually, I'm not sure which one, I think it's Juliet. She says, that which is called a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. What's in a name? It's a line that's used to remind us that sometimes we label something and we might have a negative perception of that label. If we just change the name, it wouldn't matter. But I want us to consider a different type of question when we ask that question tonight, when we come to the manger. Right, Matthew tells us this story concerning the birth of Jesus. And then that, that he tells us that Jesus was conceived in the womb of a young virgin named Mary. Or in the Greek, it's actually Miriam. That's a familiar name. And if you recall, in the Old Testament, there was a lady named Miriam who, whenever her younger brother Moses is born, she shepherds him to safety until she's cared, he's cared for by another mother. Right here, God has entrusted his son to Miriam to carry to the world, to bring him to the destination that God had planned. When she discovers that she's carrying a child, you can understand her fiancé, Joseph's concern. They were betrothed. It was Closer than our engagement, but not quite yet formally being married. His fiance is carrying someone else's child. And you can assume all you want about it, but he, being a just and righteous man, he doesn't want this to be a public dispute. He doesn't want to shame Mary. So rather than drag her to court, he's just going to divorce her quietly. The marriage had not been consummated yet, and so they were, uh, in a sense, kind of annulling the marriage. But you can tell that Joseph, he's contemplating this matter in his heart. Whenever the angel appears to Joseph in a dream, it's because he, the text tells us he had been thinking about that. He'd been pondering what this meant. 
And just like the other Joseph we read about in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, who often received visions from God in dreams, here Joseph, this Joseph, also sees an angel in a dream to deliver a message to him. In fact, the the baby in his fiancé's womb, it's not another man's, but rather it's God's own son that's been conceived by the Holy Spirit. And furthermore, the angel gives Joseph this responsibility, even though it's not his son, He's still to give the son a name, Jesus. Again, names are important, and they're especially important if they're given to you by God, right? Go back to the book of Genesis. In chapter 12, God calls a man named Abram, and one of the promises that he tells Abram is that I will make your name great, right? Abram was an old man who had no children, but God said he would have a large family. And so there's a point in Abram's story where God changes his name from Abram, which means exalted father. It's not a bad name but to Abraham, which in Hebrew means the father of many, because he would be the father of many nations. Perhaps the most significant name change we get in the Bible is actually a few generations later, in Abraham's grandson, Jacob, who, um, after spending a night wrestling with an angel, who we later find out was a manifestation of God himself, this is what the angel says in Genesis chapter 38, verse 28. Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but... Israel, for you've striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Israel means to struggle or to persevere with God. Not only would this describe Jacob's wrestling match, but it would be prophetic upon Israel, the nation, and their future. They would be a people who often were striving with, they were wrestling with God in their actions. But let's come back to Jesus now. What's in a name? Jesus, I'm going to give you just a quick ancient language lesson. In the Greek, you would pronounce it Jesus. You've heard the name Jesus before. It's not that unfamiliar. In Hebrew, it would have been Yeshua. And it's two words that are stitched together. The first part is Yahweh. That's God's personal name in the Old Testament. When you see Lord in all caps, that's Yahweh. But the second part of that means he saves. So Jesus's name literally means Yahweh saves. And in fact, this is actually what the angel tells Joseph. You shall call his name Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. While the baby Jesus' heart was beating in the womb of Mary, before he'd ever taken a breath, before he'd ever taken his first steps, before he ever tread a mile in Galilee, and before he went to the cross in Golgotha, his destiny had been told beforehand. He would save his people from their sin. It was dark that night in Bethlehem some 2,000 years ago when the child was born. And the world was then and remains now under a different type of darkness, but it was similar. Right? Sin continues to work in our world. It stirs up wars. It breaks up families. It steals people's lives and possessions. It incites lust and evil desires within our heart. But Jesus came to save us from our sins. And even at Christmas, when we sing all these hymns that are wonderful about the birth of Jesus, we can also sing that song, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Because the Son of God became a human. Well, there's another name that we're told in this brief paragraph in Matthew. Not only shall his name be called Jesus, for he'll save his people from their sins, but furthermore, we're reminded of a prophecy that the prophet Isaiah spoke some 700 years earlier. That Jesus' birth fulfilled the hopes and dreams that Israel had been waiting for for centuries. And here's the, here's the prophecy. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Right? And we're told what that means. It means God with us. Indeed, this is who Jesus is, God in the midst of humanity, to be born with a human body, a human soul, mind, and will. Understanding the hopes and the hurts of all that, all that we all share. He would eventually minister to the people in his body, heal in his body, suffer in his body, bleed from his body, and die in his body. But he would also, furthermore, raise from the dead in his body. Jesus Christ is God come near. And now, as the apostles say in Acts chapter 4, There is no other name under heaven by which we may be saved. What's in a name? 
Revelation chapter 2, verse 17 refers to those who are saved, and it says, to the one who conquers, I will give to him the hidden manna, I will give him a white stone. And here's the deal, with a new name written on that stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. And so we need to take comfort in the fact that God knows our names. If we are in Christ, we're told that our names are written in God's book because of what Jesus did by coming to earth to be born, to live, and to die. On this Christmas, let us praise this babe, Jesus Christ, with the shepherds that night, with the holy family, Mary and Joseph. Let us come bow our knee before the Lord and declare that Jesus Christ is the Lord to glory to God the Father. Amen. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for the name of your son, Jesus. Yahweh saves. God, we thank you for the salvation that he brings. If there's anyone here tonight who doesn't know that salvation, who's not confessed their sins before you and confessed that Jesus Christ is Lord, God, we pray that tonight would be instrumental in that cause in their life. God, help us to be a people who live under the lordship of Jesus, who are saved and who serve the Lord. We pray this in his name. Amen. On this Christmas Eve, we join with Christians all over the world as we gather to celebrate the birth of the one who is the light of the world. Over the last few weeks, we have lit four candles.
The first was the candle of hope, reminding us of the promises God made through the prophets of the coming Savior. Hope is like a light shining in a dark place. As we look at the light of this candle, we celebrate the hope we have in Jesus Christ. The second was the candle of peace, reminding all Christians that it is only by walking with God that true peace can be found. Peace is like a light shining in a dark place. <laughs> As we look at this candle, we celebrate the peace we find in Jesus. The third candle of joy reminds us of the message of the angels who proclaimed the joyful good news of Christ's birth. Joy is like a candle shining in, the dark, in a dark place. As we look at the candle, uh, at this uh, light of this candle, we celebrate the joy we have in Christ. The fourth candle is the candle of love to remind us that Jesus Christ is, the God, is God's gift of love to us and that in him the light of triumphs over the any darkness in our lives. Love is like a candle shining in a dark place. As we look to it at the light of its candle, we celebrate the love we have in Christ. The final candle is the Christ candle. It is placed at the center of the wreath to remind us that Christ is the center of our lives. We light the Christ candle to remind us that the light of the world was born this night. People who walked in darkness have seen a great light. For a, tri for a child has been born for us, a son given to us, authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Christ is a light shining in a dark place. As we look at the light of this wreath, we celebrate the birth of that light, Jesus Christ, into this world and in each of our hearts. Amen. I mentioned earlier that we would be taking the Lord's Supper together. I want to give just a few instructions. Um, we have two options for you here. We're going to Come forward and take the Lord's Supper, and we'll just go row by row. So once the row in front of you has come forward, feel free to get in line after behind them. Uh, we'll have two lines that'll each go this way. And uh, we have bread here to dip in the cup. Um, and for those of you who might not want to do that because of germs or health reasons, we'll also have options over there in, um, in cups that are separate that you can take. And then beyond that, when you file out that way to your uh, chairs, Along the edges, there are trash cans where you can dispose of those cups on the way back. On the night in which our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And after blessing it, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat. And afterwards, he took the cup. And after he gave thanks... He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this cup again until I drink it with you anew in my Father's kingdom. Take and drink. Would you please pray with me? Our most gracious and most merciful Father, we do not come to this your table, O Lord, trusting in our own righteousness. Rather, trusting in your great and abundant mercies. We are not so worthy as to gather up the crumbs that are underneath your table, but you are the same Lord whose way is to always have mercy. Grant, therefore, that as we eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and drink from his blood, that our bodies might be healed through his body and our souls washed through his most precious blood. 
that we might dwell evermore in you and you in us. Amen. his throne to wake as a child. He became like the least of us. Behold him, Jesus, Son of God, Messiah, Lamb, the roaring lion. Oh, be still.
Let's all stand. Would you sing it? Sun.